Whether you are in love with the creativity of the fascinating world of steampunk or you are not really sure what the deal with this subculture is, other than a nerdy sense of fashion, this video is right for you. And if you're into poetic lyrics with rich and imaginative lore and evocative music, and I know you are, you are going to love this song, whether you already know it or not. Welcome back, metalheads, to a new analysis of rock music where we also delve into the cultural background that inspired it. And today, our topic is steampunk, a genre that has long fascinated me for its concepts and aesthetic, as exemplified in the wonderfully creative music of Abney Park. You guys know how much I love exploring the way in which different aspects of 19th century and earlier literature uh, seep into uh, rock and metal music. So uh, steampunk is a very out of the ordinary in, uh, in the um, area of uh, rock music and I had to take a closer look at it with you guys. Steampunk is a cultural subgenre in fiction, music and fashion, combining historical settings and anachronistic elements centered around steam-powered machinery. But the specifics of it are a bit muddled, because steampunk has branched into a variety of directions. It has been defined as alternative histories that frequently explore the rise of new technologies in Victorian England and throughout its global empire, and also as presenting a new view of the future through anachronistic elements of the past. So steampunk is sort of a catch-all term. It is thus a marriage between fantasy and sci-fi, between past and future. It is future in the past, as some pieces of fiction portray a future world as it would have been imagined in the 19th century, typically, or past in the future, as others make up post-apocalyptic worlds where humanity hasn't yet redeveloped past the age of steam power. Think uh, Mad Max or Mortal Engines. Though the subgenre itself appeared around the 1980s, so uh, it is uh, quite a recent one, authors were inspired by 19th century sci-fi literature like uh, Jules Verne, Mary Shelley, H.G. Wells, Rudyard Kipling, and uh, even some very down-to-earth writers like E.M. Forster, who also tried his hand at sci-fi, which may well count as steampunk by today's standards as well. But what unites the different trends is a nostalgia for the past, for things which were good but were lost to time. A past when people valued beauty alongside practicality, when architecture and technological devices and clothes were intricate and ornate instead of minimalistic, where they were meant to resist the test of time rather than be disposable. A past where great thinkers, scientists and writers were seen as rock stars. A past where expansion and technological advances weren't thought to be dangerous for the planet or for humanity or for a certain group of people, but were thought as mankind at its best. But then we have the punk element, which uh, uh, signals rebellion against authority, social norms. So steampunk can put its rose-tinted glasses aside and combine the glory of the past, adding in social and philosophical commentary, calling out wrongs from the past, expose the dark side of human nature, its potential for destruction and self-destruction, while doubting the power that science can gain in the hands of man. Thus, steampunk can be humanistic, hopeful and glorious, or it can be dystopian. And let's not forget that steampunk is more related to the gothic side of 19th century literature, so uh, deep psychology and dark themes are explored within this genre. And uh, now that we've covered a bit of the cultural context of this music genre, let's listen to a song that provides a brilliant example of how these concepts merge into a work of art. Herr Drosselmeyer's Doll is a song from the 2008 album Lost Horizons by the American steampunk band Abney Park. And uh, this is the first American band that I'm covering on this channel. And uh, also, uh, I'm pretty sure that 
it will be the most peaceful song that you have heard so far on my channel, um, in terms of sound at least. So, let's listen. The main character is introduced as Herr Drosselmeyer, which, if you remember, is the name of the godfather in Tchaikovsky's ballet The Nutcracker. He's an inventor, a manufacturer of clocks and figurines, and an overall magician-like figure. This 19th century character perfectly sets the tone for a steampunk rendition of the myth of the creator, his obsession with his creation and the sacrifices in the name of his craft, a steampunk Pygmalion, if you will. Our Herr Drosselmeyer has built a life-size doll made to perform on stage as a ballerina. The doll looks and moves remarkably lifelike. She dances and spins in front of the audience and while Herr Drosselmeyer watches from a distance, he seems to be anxious and there is a sense of relief when the spectacle is finished and the curtains finally fall. Does this mean that there is something that can go wrong during the performance? So he's called here Hair Doctor, suggesting uh, not only that he's a master craftsman, a true professional, but also a healer. The doll's cracks are like wounds from every fall that she has endured during her performances. So the doll is wound up, she is activated every morning with the key and the, the little cogs tick inside her like a clock. She is taught ballet moves and she is able to perform even difficult ones. But we see now that she is far from perfect. Her outside is cracking and falling apart from long use. And now we understand why uh, the doctor is so nervous while watching her performances, hoping to dear God that she wouldn't break down until the show is over. So after every performance, Herr Drosselmeyer has to repair her. It is, in a sense, the proof of the sacrifices she is making herself to the art. And only the doctor's ministrations can cure her and prepare her for her next performance. See the dedication in his gestures, all those tools, the minute adjustments to her appearance, his attention that makes hours fly until it is evening already by the time he's done. And by the time the moment of her next performance arrives, his entire day, his every day is dedicated to her. Patient, patient. Twinkle 
Cause as she chokes and swoons, the ladies are sure. As we hear him talking to the doll, we can almost hear a father talking to his little girl. It sounds very sweet, very paternal, very protective, comforting. He calls her pet names, Bumblebee, and reassures her that she will be fine and she will soon go back to the dances that she loves, do doing arabesques in the cheers of the audience. He regards her with profound admiration, no doubt. He knows she is beautiful because he has made her beautiful, but his attitude is uh, not really Pygmalion's here, right? We are described her clothes, her uh, little pout uh, painted with uh, lipstick, but uh, it's not in a sensual way exactly. The doctor has not created a perfect lover for himself, but rather a masterpiece to show the world and he is proud of her and he is proud of his achievement. So he takes her out and introduces her to the audience, probably for the thousandth time by now. And uh, now we're going to hear his speech that he gives to... Um, the people who are gathered there to uh, watch the ballet. You know how much I love uh, monologues in songs and all that. Let's hear it. Gentlemen, this fallen angel is the illegitimate daughter of art and science, a modern marvel of engineering. Clockworks elevated to the very natural process which even now is in your blood racing, your eyes flashing at such irreproachable beauty. Here is Gaia, here is Eve, here is Lilith, and I stand before you as her father. Sprung fully formed from my brow, dewy and sweet, she can be yours and yours again, for her flesh is the incorruptible pale, the excuse from the wages of sin. This part never fails to give me goosebumps. What a flawless recitation. You can close your eyes and see the doctor and his ballerina and the masses crowding to see her. This speech is nothing short of brilliant. I love, uh, first of all, in terms of the sound, how it uh, um, continues to immerse us even deeper into that um, 19th century setting that it is creating. And you can see the doctor uh, gesturing, suddenly theatrical and impassioned. His speech is full of grandeur, meant to amaze the audience watching breathless as he uncovers his masterpiece. He presents her as a modern marvel of engineering, something pioneering that will change the world. He gives them just enough details to stir their curiosity, but also keep the mystery and make it sound almost like magic. The intricate machinery of clockwork mechanisms is like blood inside of her, moving every part of her body and making her come to life. So the doctor compares her with these primordial female beings. Gaia, Eve, Lilith, the first of their kind, just like the doll is the first of its kind, and uh, presumably the first of more to follow if everything goes right in Herr Drosselmeyer's business. And the doctor is her father, he's the creator, like God himself, able to create life where none other could. The scientist is God. But there is more to it. There is a subtext to it. So let's listen to uh, the last couple of lines from uh, this part again, because uh, not only that I cannot get enough of it, but also because there is some nuance there that I uh, um, uh, intentionally glossed over until now, and we're going to get into it. Here is Gaia, here is Eve, here is Lilith, and I stand before you as her father. Sprung fully formed from my brow, dewy and sweet, she can be yours and yours again, for her flesh is the incorruptible pale, the excuse from the wages of sin. And as the sacrifice. 
cloth stood in slumps beneath these chipped and china balloons. The sour flesh pines, grunts and thumps. Step right up, boys. So the cloth that covers the door falls. He turns the key and we can hear it in that lovely touch of a sound effect. And she starts dancing in all her splendor. But we can see now that her Drossola milestone has changed quite radically. If previously, when it was just the two of them before the show, he spoke to her paternally, here there is an obvious sexual component to the way in which he describes the doll. So from a primordial goddess and a marvel of science, she becomes a feminine ideal made for man. And uh, from that to a prostitute, there is only a small step. The occupation that the doctor is in uh, may take the form of an art because of the uh, uh, beauty of it and the performative aspect, but it is also a business because he needs funds to get on with his research, right? And we can assume that the doctor is underappreciated looking at the state of his door. Look at the description of the door right now. She suddenly seems old and sad. And yet the doctor pushes her onwards for the audience. Although he loves her dearly, there is only so much he can do for her without the right amount of money. So what he does is objectify her. His presentation is aimed at the masses who have a limited understanding of science, and this shows in his choice of words. He has to lower himself to their level, uh, emphasizing the spectacular and the carnal. He knows that the exaggerated and the flamboyant sells, and he knows that sex sells as well. So what he does is spark the gentleman's imagination by talking about her allure and about sin and about a perfect female figure with no other desire than to please the eye and also the touch, because the men are invited to turn the key. She can be yours for a mere tuppence. This has turned quite dark and sad. And uh, I love how the whimsical music box uh, toy shop at the end of the world uh, sound turns grave with this deep and soulful violin at the end, somber like a realization. This is not a naive depiction of the wonders of science. This is also a song about objectification, about art turned into a commodity, about the masses that choose spectacle over genius, and it is about the sacrifices made in the name of art and science, both of the creator and of the creation. So many layers in such a short song. Steampunk is more than a nerdy genre for cosplayers, and it is much more than an aesthetic, and Abney Park illustrate this perfectly in their sound, lyrics, and fantastic performances. They describe their music as music from a time that never was, but may still come to pass. Beautiful, isn't it? So this was my analysis, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I may go on with uh, uh, Steampunk and uh, do another uh, song from Abney Park or uh, from another band if you have any suggestions uh, going into another uh, uh, branch of Steampunk other than the uh, uh, Victorian one that we've just seen. You know how I uh, talk very much about different aspects of 19th century liter literature. See 
being into metal so if uh, you enjoy this video please uh, like it and subscribe to my channel in order to uh, stay tuned for more analysis of rock and metal lyrics see you next time